Good day and welcome back to the 40 Audio Podcast with your host, as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. How are you guys doing today? Today's episode, we're going to be talking to a very lovely man that I met um, online, a guy called uh, Pedro Ferreira, and we're going to be going through a lot of the different aspects of living as an autistic in this very neurotypical world. We're going to be talking about things around independence, something that I saw from a company called uh, Drexel University, apparently around one in five of autistic people have ever lived independently since leaving high school. We're also going to be talking about romance, platonic relationships. You know, we, we see a lot, particularly for autistic people in terms of the isolation statistics with uh, uh, around 79% of autistic people reporting feeling socially isolated, which is an absolutely crazy, crazy number. And then we're also going to be talking about employment, which is something that I think a lot of people can also struggle with. Uh, Shocking kind of data that I've seen around is that only 22% of individuals have any type of employment. And that's not talking about just full-time it's even talking about like part-time employment and stuff. So the reason why I, I got and got sort of chatting to, to Pedro is because a lot of the things that I particularly want to do with my work in terms of raising the the quality of life, would you say statistics, the quality of life, raise raising the quality of life of autistic people. Because it, it it is very very difficult living living as an autistic person in in today's society and and you know it, particularly in the past and so we're going to be talking about those things that I've I've said with Pedro. Um, we're also going to be speaking about the particular incident incidences of uh, bullying and harassment, which I know is also um, a very common thing for a lot of autistic people having having those experiences online in the workplace at school and we're all gonna we're gonna kind of tie this together and talk about how you know all of these kind of life statistics can can impact someone's mental health and confidence so pedro uh Ferreira is 40 and he describes himself as kind of falling through the cracks with with being autistic and I really want today to be an opportunity to kind of highlight some of, I guess, the the real angles of of these stats that we see online, and uh, talk about the impact that it can really have on on people's lives when we're not included. So, Pedro, how are you doing today? I'm uh, I'm all right, thanks, thanks, Thomas. Good. Um, I know when we were just chatting before we started recording, you were telling me about your um your recent birthday how, yeah. how did that go for you it was all right i had my uh, most of my closest family around me um it was but it was, i mean it wasn't um anything hugely big or anything it's kind of a shame that i wasn't given a sort of a bigger 40th birthday it was a bit of a missed opportunity sure. um, and i well, think it's a, bit, a, it's a big that, day isn't it I suppose. yeah i think i was uh I think that's partly because of the lack of friends I have and the, due to the autism and stuff like that. So uh, I think I've had more friends around me than I'd be able to celebrate more. Um, I was just going to say, plus my parents don't really believe much in birthdays. They're of that generation. They don't see the importance mm. of birthdays. So, yeah. 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 I, um, I have I have sort of a weird relationship with birthdays. I've had some really good birthdays in the past, but I think there's just some some aspect of like the expectation both on on me to to have a good time and to be happy on my birthday and also like the expectations that I might have on on other people to to make me have a good day. So I always have a pretty difficult time when it comes comes around to my birthdays. <laughs> Same with me. I mean, I, I I set mental goals for myself as to what I want to have done by the time I reach a certain birthday, especially when sure. I reach 40. And so there's been a lot of pressure over the past few years to mm. 
to fulfill those goals before I reach 40, uh, kind of expectations and also my own personal goals. And because I haven't done those, it's given me a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure and feeling exhausted mentally and Mm. physically and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's so difficult to be powerless to be able to to be able to get stuff done that you want to get done by a certain date. Yes. But then at the same time, people tell me that there are expectations by the time you reach a certain age that you have to have done certain things when that's not true. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just if you get that reinforcement that you do have to set deadlines by by um by the time you're a certain age, then it's very difficult to to go against that, you know, and and to think sure. positively. Sure. And I think I think that's something that I it has been reflected both in my my work with autistic young people is that there is a very large sense from from anyone that I've talked to that they feel like they're kind of falling behind with things or they're not meeting these kind of societal expectations of them. And I think overall that can be very damaging damaging to us because it's already quite difficult sort of adjusting to and navigating the world that we live in. And for for a lot of people who aren't autistic, they they can struggle a lot too. And it's it's like this kind of compounding variable of, you know, things being a little bit different for us, things some things being harder particularly stuff around kind of like life school life skills and things like that that can make achieving those goals and those milestones really difficult like one yeah. of one of the things that i think comes to mind is things around driving you know i i know how to drive i've i've done my test i've passed it can't do it on a regular basis it's just not something that i can like manage with with my, my anxiety levels um, on a, on a da- on a daily basis, it's nothing that I can like crutch on, if that makes sense. So it's, I guess, like what, what, where I really want to start off with our chat. It's kind of kind of starting a little bit more more at the start, but also touching a little bit in the independence aspect. The thing that I was talking about, you know, as I mentioned at the start, um, one in five of autistic people have ever lived independently after leaving high school, which is, you know, I think, although it's not necessarily a horribly bad thing, I think it's something that a lot of people can let, let it impact like their self-esteem and it can also impact the way that other people see you as well. Um, just yeah. from my own, my own personal experience. So when, when were you diagnosed and what has been your experience with attaining that independence and those life skills up until now? So I was diagnosed very late, unlike a lot of people today. I was diagnosed in 2019, which is, I mean, I was born in 83, so you can see quite a lot of time has passed. Yes, yeah. And so what what, what age were you? Were you? Sorry. I was about... 37 wow I would say about. that's a very light diagnosis then yeah yeah it was so i had already been diagnosed very late with learning disabilities as well so um dyslexia i yes, think i have yeah. i think i have undiagnosed dyspraxia as well because i'm quite clumsy but dyslexia definitely i was diagnosed after after I did my GCSEs. So only mm-hmm. when I retook my GCSEs did I get a diagnosis. And apparently they knew, I think they sort of had an inkling or they knew beforehand when I was doing my GCSEs that I, that I was dyslexic, but they didn't tell me. Yes, yeah. So I, th- I thought that I got extra time in the exam because I was slow at writing, but now in retrospect, they they told me that it was actually dyslexia. Sure. So since I was born, I've, I've, I was always a very quiet person and very non-social with other kids. Yeah. And I would, I would have <laughs> problems socialising with others. I'd have social anxiety. I wouldn't know exactly how to communicate with other kids. So 
in, in nursery, for instance, I had problems joining in with other kids playing around or whatever because yeah. I didn't know how to. So I was just on the sidelines a lot. And yeah. it that's was... that's something that, that I've I've experienced as well. I think when when I did my podcast with my mom talking about the way that, that I was around other kids, I was very much like a sitting standing at the sidelines kind of observing what's happening like <laughs> I mean I don't remember this but I th- from what I've been told I was actually taken out of univer- uh, university I was taken out of nursery because yeah. I was having such problems get uh, sort of getting along with other kids and being in that situation where uh, sensory environment of having kids Mm. around me was just too much for me. I remember I was upset quite a lot. And even at that age, I was picked on. I mean, mean, I've been picked on quite a lot over the years because of my disability. And I've I've certainly been looked down upon because of my disability Mm. my entire life. But uh, even back then, though, I was sort of, picked on because of my because of the way I was acting and it wasn't yeah. seen as the normal way to behave so um yeah that and that continued I think throughout my school schooling year and I kind of didn't really make one many friends I had I had one friend yeah one good friend who I've known since primary school and 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 that's those are and he's the only person that I've ever like uh, c- consistently uh, talked to or spoken to. And he lives far away now, so I can't see him every week. But it's it, it, it's impacted my ability to socialize with other people in the sense that uh, socializing with others has been. It, it, it's very difficult to ha- have a voice in a group with loud people. Yes. Yeah. I feel like everyone is talking over me, so people have a probably a deeper, higher voice, so their voices come through more easily, and they will talk over me. They will just I, I will be drowned out if I try to mm. if I try to make a joke or something. I'll be drowned out by someone sure. who's who makes a joke first or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's and also trying to find similar interests as well, and I think that's that's another thing as well. But yeah, well, uh, what the, are you what interested is, in? Did you say that you were you were like had a? Yeah, really well, like I'm a bit of a games. film. I, I'm a bit of a film buff, a uh, bit of a TV buff. I'm into yeah, video games, re- retro collecting video games. Unfortunately for my parents, I have a very expensive hobby. <laughs> which which is again uh i think it's partly you know i think it's partly ocd but partly mm. because i like it as a hobby because it's interesting to be able to co- go after and collect something but i, I mean if you see things that that used to be my like staple whether it was like playing like game cards or yeah like pokemon perhaps like on on the yeah. on your games or, or even just like types of rocks or types of figurines or like pa- paperweights at one point. My my grandma actually took me to a car boot sale once and I saw a paperweight and I was like, ooh, looks, it was kind of this red one that had like these bubbles in. I was like, oh, I quite like that. So she got me it. And then for like the preceding, like every birthday that I came across, she'd buy me like this, like increasingly more elaborate paperweight. So I just ended up with this like, box like this really heavy box of all these paperweights <laughs> well I'm, I'm i'm a bit of a hoarder but i mean i like to i i know exactly what i want to collect for but obviously there'll be other things that come up during the year like maybe a book uh, a book to do something else mm. that i'll be mm. interested in buying or something but it'll still be pricey so but the thing about retro gaming is that it's getting more and more unnecessarily expensive. Sure. Because, because there's this uh, bigger uh, sort of demand mm. in uh, supply and demand, I think they call it. So. Yeah, yeah. So Because okay, the nature of retro games is that they are mm. retro. Like <laughs> the, the 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 supply of them is is naturally quite limited. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, so, most people when they when they go for 
collections and you'll see them post they always post online their collections they'll do mm. unboxing videos or, or something like yeah. that yeah. Uh, where they'll show off their collection and i've been collecting now you know for years since 2009 mm. at least 2008 2009 but i've been a slow collector so there have been people that collect sets of games over a period of a couple of years and they complete their collection and then they go and f- they go and flip flip it for outrageous Another prices thing, yeah. or whatever but so so i've been in it for the long haul <laughs> because because it's been a, a financial issue i haven't devoted my all my money to that and and yeah it's it's yeah it's 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 a good hobby but it's um it's I, in a perfect word i'd love to have it all funded by someone else because it's just <laughs> crazy it's just uh yeah well i, su- I suppose by the nature of it it could be s- some some level of would you say like like some people go and like they buy like gold or they buy like assets that are not money and then it kind of appreciates over time or that kind mm. that kind of thing so may, may, maybe at, at some point your collection might be worth like a lot of money yeah you but I, and... and you know i never see it as a, I, I realized that i could i could sell it and you know get a lot of money but the thing about it is is that this is what i'm this is what makes me happy and sure. second and second of all i always wanted to have I never wanted to buy a collection of games so that I could flip it for outrageous, outrageous prices. I always wanted to keep an archive of like a library, like a, like so people have libraries of books. Hmm. I wanted to have a, like a library of video games to, to refer to uh, so that sure. I could talk, so that I could talk about them, you know, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, Having autism it can give you a bit of an obsession about things, and that's yeah, kind of yeah. annoyed my parents a little bit in the past because they don't like to hear about my obsessions. You know, mm-hmm. I got them to watch the TV show Quantum Leap, and they really do not want to watch that show. But I kind of have Quantum. to force them to watch that show. It's a it's an older show as well. It's not a new show, and they don't mind watching an older show, but it's just the fact that it's not really their style of what they want to watch. But um, sure. I just, yeah, I, I just, um, it's got a good rating, hasn't it? I haven't seen that one. It seems to be about time travel. Yeah, it's it, they they rebooted it recently with a new cast, but mm-hmm. the original one was it ran from the late eighties to early nineties. And it was it was a well-meaning kind of science fiction show about a guy who accident who sort of wants the time travel and he accidentally finds himself in the body of other people and he's putting mm-hmm. things right that went that once went wrong at the power sure. at the uh, through through some force force whether it's God or some entity or power or whatever he's he's being asked to do this so he's. He's unintentionally jumping from one person's body into another, and mm. and mm. and and he's fixing people's lives, and he, you know, he, he's he's kind of bumbling his way through it the best he can because mm. he's a mm. regular. He's not an action hero; he's a scientist. So, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I'll probably have to check that out. I I'm I'm very bad at like watching, like. Old, older movies <laughs> i just mostly consume like television through like netflix and stuff i'm very um it's very episodic so it's not serialized so it's only serialized and that each episode ends on a cliffhanger for the next episode mm. right right so yeah so, like like doctor who kind of style yeah yeah doctor who sort of yeah similar to that yeah although this was kind of rare in the late 80s to have a tv show that kind of ended on a cliffhanger most tv shows would end would would just end their episode and yeah. then you'd go next week to watch the next episode so mm-hmm. yeah that's interesting it has well, an interesting I'm... view of the future as well very outdated view of the future but very yes. interesting view and it's a shame that they didn't keep it for the reboot because the the reboot is very clinical it's very much like watching um NCIS which is by the same people actually yeah yeah so interesting 
Well, um, I, I, I enjoy chatting, uh, chatting about this stuff, but I'm just, just interested, like, I know you've told me a little bit about kind of your, your overarching kind of experience being, being autistic kind of in a bit more, more of the younger age. But, uh, one thing that, that seems to come up for me a lot and just by looking at a lot of like the programs that are out there, the, the level of trans like support for transitioning to adulthood is very, very limited. Like we could talk about how limited like the education systems can be in, in supporting autistic people, but the actual transition period, usually about 18 to 25, very, very limited. There are a lot of like schemes and stuff in the UK, which particularly target that group, but there's, 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 there's pretty much zip like for, for, anything outside of that age range and it mm. leaves a lot of people kind of as 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 you said before about like you know, falling through the cracks where where you kind yeah. of you don't have that support with moving moving out developing a social group developing independence living on your own those, those kind of things it's not something that's necessarily taught in school or no. guided after after you finish those and especially in your case you know um not having a diagnosis, autism diagnosis. Um, I imagine that that's, that's even, even more difficult, but, um, in terms of independence, like what, what has been your experience with trying to, trying to attain that? Like, have you come across any hurdles? Yeah. I mean, I, I've never felt, I've, I've never felt like I've been competent to do things by myself. And, you you mentioned, for instance, driving. I haven't I haven't learned how to drive. Sure. But stuff like living by myself has been a struggle because I haven't had a job to financially financially support living by myself, and I've been given no support financially as well because again sure. I fall I fall out of that I fall through the cracks of what is what I'm entitled to. So I can get personal independence payment, but that's that's it. I'm not entitled to anything else because I have a savings account. Sure. So you have to waste your savings account in order to be able to get benefits. Yes. Which is yeah. kind of goes completely against the whole point of saving up, really. Mm-hmm. A savings account, essentially. I mean, they're asking you to save money. But then at the same time, they're not willing to give you support in order to save money. They want you to waste money so that you can rely on them for benefit. It's as soon as I started to put myself in a situation where I was looking for a place to live, it's been one hurdle after another trying to get support based on my neurodiversity and it's complete nightmare and i've i've kind of i've i've got a caseworker on it but i've kind of left it to her because i can't manage that myself anymore because i'm concentrating on trying to get a job yeah and yeah. even that i'm getting help now trying to apply for a job because applying for a job would give me independence as well but the problem of applying for a job is that i again in terms of uh, employment, I've fallen through the cracks. And you, mm. you've spoken about how people who left school or university have not had uh, the kind of the tools or, or the support needed to be able to progress into adulthood. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I left university, that my prospects were, I thought were, my prospects were pretty good. For, for I thought I thought I was going to do okay. But as soon as I saw myself within the same job as everyone else, I suddenly realized that I was I was small fish. You know, mm. I, I was not going to get any support that I, uh, regardless if I had dyslexia or not. Sure. What my degree level did not mean anything to, uh, uh, to, to, to to basically getting a job in film and television or film reviewing for magazines or stuff like that. They were happy Mm. 
companies were happy for me to work for free, sure. but, but they weren't willing to pay me. Right. And so they're, ran- they're kind of shuttling down you the, the volunteer routes. There, there have been many temporary roles, unpaid temporary roles or paid temporary roles where I would have liked to have been developed as an individual because there were jo- those are jobs that I actually really enjoyed doing. But the thing is, I was never given, uh, I was never given uh, any development support. I was never developed it. My, none, of any, none of my possible talent was nurtured. Hmm. So hmm. I've kind of gone through life stumbling from one job to another, trying to make a career of myself. And as a result, I don't have a career because I, had, I got horrible anxiety issues, which has uh, affected me and made, made, made me have debilitating symptoms of anxiety. So getting up in the morning and doing things have been difficult for me, depending sure. on how bad I have anxiety issues. And, I relate to that a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and because of the COVID lockdown and then trying to get in back into work after the COVID lockdown, it's been a complete nightmare. And you'd think that with my CV and what I have on my CV, that it would be enough experience for me to be able to get a sort of a novice role within a company. But it's not. It's I'm back at square one again. I've, I've not been given the kind of support that I should be getting in career development. Do you, do you mind me asking you a little bit about like your, your parents' perspective on, on kind of the independence aspect of it? Have you had much like feedback feedback from them do they do they have any kind of worries about that, oh, yeah, that my, aspect or my parents have great worries about me they don't understand the nature of my neurodiversity my autism my dyslexia they're generally worried for me and they're in a lot of uh, the, they 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 suffer quite a lot because of that for me it's disconcerting that I can't uh, that I can't like give my parents the kind of the kind of relaxation they need in terms of not having to worry about me. But it's it's um, it, it's there's a lot of pressure on me, and I think a lot of the anxiety issues that I've had have come from the pressure I've received from my parents in terms of trying to trying to make something for myself so that I can be independent, whether it's a job or anything else like that. I've in terms of employment, it's been an incredibly difficult issue where I've tried to go for jobs and even with my CV you think I have a lot of experience, but it hasn't meant really anything to an employer. Mm-hmm. And they look at is my... That, is that because I know I, I, from experience, a lot of the things that autistic people that I've talked to tend to struggle with is like the interview process, particularly when like applying for jobs. Well, it's not the interview process that's been my stumble. It's uh, actually getting an interview based on my application. My really? application has been the the big problem. My application uh, gets ignored completely. I've been told by someone at Job Centre Plus that who who deals with neurodiversity actually, and she told me that I should not be applying for jobs by myself, and that's why I've been getting help trying to apply for jobs, because the way I interpret questions, the way I respond to questions is not is obviously not working for them uh, because I don't even get an interview for a job. And these are jobs that I could be really good for. Like these are jobs that uh, I'm, I'm suitable for. I've, I've got huge amount of experience uh, as an archive assistant, but I can't get those types of types of jobs because uh, I I just, um, I apply in a way that they don't, understand like that they don't it, See, it doesn't interest them in some way and so I, that, I that, that's confusing for me because 
Like, if if you have the requirements for for a particular job, yeah. it's it's within reasonable adjustments within like the 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 law that you should be offered an interview. Like, well, they it, say if you have the requirements, but if you meet the requirements, sure, but the. They they may say that somehow you don't meet the requirements, and then that is seen by them as a good excuse not to have me come in for an interview or something like that. If they look at my CV, clearly they can see that I have enough experience hmm. for it. Yeah, and you should you should be offered a job if you have the experience for it, which is. Hmm. But based on based on. Well, not uh, off- offered a job, offered an interview, at least. Uh, ba- based off the application, I'm not getting an interview, and that's the main problem i mean we can go through the conspiracy route but i don't ha- i don't have any data i don't have any i don't have enough kind of evidence to suggest that it's a blacklisting thing or so, or for some reason it's because i am neurodiverse or you know one thing that seems clear to me now uh, having applied for so many jobs over the years is that there's disability confident there's a disability confident website where it has a whole list of uh, companies that have disability confident next to them, and as in they, they can support people with disabilities, kind of thing. That's right. That's right. So they 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 don't. I think very few of these. Um, actually, are disability confident? I think it's. I think they see it as a label. The companies, mm. when they put disability confident onto their uh, website or whatever, I think that they see it just as a kind of a label to say that they're disability confident. I don't think they really are because there's, in my experience, applying for jobs. I've, I haven't had any interviews for jobs or anything like that and it's a shame because again these are jobs i could be going for but uh, there's so much competition but why am i not the competition you know yeah yeah i uh i sorry you go first you go first first. (laughs) i think that there is definitely some like particularly because you you've applied for jobs and you haven't been offered an interview and you have have the skills and you have the like the the evidence for that like they they should be they should be offering you an interview um at the very least because you know it it is something that that is kind of mandated by reasonable adjustments and it and i would say that in a lot of those cases perhaps approaching like an advocacy organization um who would be able to advocate for you in in those circumstances mm. then that would be like the uh, probably the ideal situation i know that with particularly with application processes interviews things like that it's very often quite unspecific the questions that they ask like they don't ask you very specific questions that they're like oh tell me about this and i'm like oh okay what what about this oh, about this or you know how do you want me to communicate this information that you want from me. And I find that even with things like exams and stuff at university, you know, the questions are they're not clear enough. And, you know, I think, you know, perhaps if if organizations were a bit more clear with the language around the questions that you use and they provided some detail about how they want you to answer them, then it would be a lot better. There was a company that I applied for. It was a archive assistant. It's a well-known mm-hmm. uh, online company. It was for an archive assistant, and I applied for it. I and I did my I did my CV. I did a, a covering letter, and the covering letter gave a lot of good information that they needed. Mm-hmm. And. They say on their website, if you need reasonable adjustments, if you need us to contact you about what is going to be put in your application, please contact us and we will contact you back to talk about your application to you before you, uh, as it's being submitted as a sure. if you're if if you fall within the disability bracket, you know. 
Mm-hmm. So I did that. Mm-hmm. And they were nice enough to come back to me and they were nice enough to talk me through my uh, application. And I thought, hey, this is great. I mean, I can't fail here to get an interview because they're actually helping me go for the go for the role, essentially. Yeah. They're going to ask me further questions to add to and the answers I'm going to give are going to add to that application. So this is this is terrific. And so they did that. And I didn't get the interview. And I thought, so even with their help, I still didn't get the interview. So what's going on? Well, they actually did provide feedback because I'm neurodiverse. They actually did offer feedback. And their feedback was very, very strange as to why I didn't get to interview process. They gave me the excuse that there's a lot of competition. Okay, fine. Why, with my experience, why... Did I still not be the competition? Mm-hmm. But the other thing was a lot, it, their feedback seemed to be mostly nitpicking, real, real nitpicking, so that to, to try and t- give me reasons why I didn't get an interview. But stuff that, stuff that I forgot to include in my application that I wouldn't think to include. Unless they asked you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, really silly stuff, Thomas. Like, really silly stuff. Like, are you aware? Like, how would you, in a workplace, how would you promote IT? And I'm like, but that for an archive role, like archive assistant role, why would I want to promote IT to my fellow colleagues? Like, I don't understand. Why would yeah, I need I don't to understand know that? that one either. The other one, <laughs> the other one was. Uh, you didn't show that you were aware of diversity in the workplace. It does. It seems very, very random. Like extremely that, random. That particularly, um, a lot of perhaps um, organizations use like other means to to give give evidence for why they don't hire someone or why they why they let people go, mm. and they, they they tend to be very like. As you said, kind of weird and off off topic and a bit nitpicky because I think a lot of people they they don't like they see they see the the needs that that we have in terms of sort of fitting into the work the workplace and that they don't want to say that it's because we're autistic or because we're disabled because that's against the law that's discrimination. So I think. You know, particularly for for individuals, which you know, there's quite a lot of people who might struggle with like the social atmosphere, the social in, inner workings of the organization. You know, not, not fit, not being a good fit for the team. That kind of spiel that they can give that can that can really harm us because we're, although we have the actual technical skills and and experience, they don't hire us because they they don't think we'll get along along with the social environment. Which is funny because that's kind of what you need to do when you are including someone who is different in an organization. Yeah. I and mean, can you imagine if those were the excuses as to why I didn't get previous interviews? I mean, I've applied for so, so many roles over the years. I can't keep track of how many roles I've applied for. Some of them have been kind of half asked kind of like you know like I've applied for the roles I think well if I get it I get it if I don't I don't and then there are roles I've really really wanted and I put huge amounts of time and effort into applying for and I didn't even get an interview and uh, I mean I don't understand yes it's 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 really bizarre and crazy to me have you had any experience with paid employment like Oh yeah, yeah. I've had so I've had a lot of temp roles in employment, and I've had a permanent role. I worked for I worked for a telecommunications company for six years. Well, I started off good. as a temp there, and I worked there for six years, but I did not really enjoy it. Like I could do the job; the job was fine. But did you I, did I, you have any any issues within the job or yeah? Because I yeah. know that there, there is aspects of like the social things and perhaps things around communication and yeah. clarity of instruction that can be quite difficult. 
and also like the sensory aspect of things and the social aspects of you know perhaps yeah. customer service related jobs where you have to talk to the general public well the the more heightened my anxiety is the more sensory sensitive i can be so i get distracted very Sorry. easily under pressure yeah i get very dist- uh, i get distracted very easily under pressure and i didn't get along with the people there naturally i was seen as the odd one out i was seen as the bizarre guy the loner the weirdo right. whatever because social discrimination and exclusion then yeah and and that's hard my bosses i had two different bosses and they were actually all right to me in certain ways but they didn't know i was diagnosed with autism at the time and neither did i so they knew i was dyslexic that's fine but they uh, they they maybe they would have treated me a bit differently uh, if they'd known that I was autistic but yeah uh, I didn't the the thing is I'm doing a job that's very repetitive and it's not in a field it's not in a sector that I've really wanted to work in and uh I was going all the way to Stevenage to work in this role mm. and what what kind of commute is that? Like it's one and a half hours away. One and a half hours. One oh and a half God. hours away. So taking the tube, uh, then the rail. Wow. So it's one of one and a half hours. So that's, there. that's an added stress. Like so that's that's three hours. Three hours in total. That's oh three hours in total. So I'd come. I'd get home like about seven thirty, eight o'clock. Yeah. yeah. For dinner, hmm. and so and I have to be at like nine o'clock each day. So, 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 so it was, it was, um, and, and I, again, I already had anxiety issues by this point. So every day waking up and going to Stevenage, uh, like rushing to get to the platform on time because the, the trains, the rail, the rail trains only come like every what, half an hour. So if you miss that, if you miss that train, you're going to be half an hour late. So uh, yeah, it's just a complete nightmare. I mean, some of the people there were nice, but on the whole, everyone did not understand me because they didn't know I was autistic. And as a human being, I was not respected. I'm, I'm. If you think about it, I'm in a role doing work that is not what I'm most interested in doing, and I'm not being praised for it. So it's like I would get very depressed sometimes when I was going to work that I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, eventually, they made me redundant. So, And, and why, did, why did that happen? Oh, well, they uh, moved all of the work to India because it's cheaper. Right. Okay. Okay. I could have got a did, job working. Did they give you a good reference and stuff? Like, Well, if they've given me a good reference, I haven't seen it because obviously, you know, when you go for interviews, uh, we need to get an interview to go get a reference. So they're down for, I think one of them is is at least down for a reference, but we haven't had to use them yet. So, you know, really. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's been it's been kind of crazy. But there have been roles that I've really like jobs that where I've worked for a brief period of time where. I've either had temporary paid work or non-paid work where I've really wanted to work and I haven't been allowed to develop. And because I've been stumbling from one job to another, I've kind of fallen through the cracks of employment. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been in touch with any organizations which are kind of supporting you to, to, to develop that kind of path through things? And I've had work coaches, uh, but the problem is I've, all the work coaches I've had have been very general work coaches. Their level of help has been has not been successful in me getting any interviews or anything like this. So I've been um, I, I went through one organisation recently, and it was I was in terms of it was a bit disorganised. I have to say the guy was really nice to me. But I have to I have to say that the guy, um, the guy that I was speaking to, my work coach, he uh, was so disorganized setting up and 
being aware of how to use a computer that I ended up spending half of the time lecturing him and, and tutoring him on how to use web pages and stuff like that. Jesus. Which is not what you want from a work coach. I no, shouldn't be coaching no. them. Well, um, it's it's been been uh, I wouldn't say good, but it's been very informative to hear about your your experience. And I feel like a lot of people who are who are listening probably identify with a lot of the things that you're saying, especially late diagnosed individuals. You know, live living and working nowadays. It's it's not the best, and even if you do manage to get the what do you say the 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 minimum adjustments and the 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 interviews that are in force for people who have the qualifications for it it's it's still not the an, an ideal for a lot of autistic people i'm just wondering um if we could kind of shift gears a little bit and yeah i guess talk about the more kind of social emotional side of things sure you know there is a large percentage of autistic people. There's a very, there's a small percentage of people who don't, but a lot of people who desire to have romantic and platonic relationships. Uh, but it can often be quite elusive for a lot of people. And as we've seen with the statistics around social isolation, it's it's a very prevalent issue, um, and it, it often has a lot to do with someone's like well-being outcomes whether they have a good friend group or they have a partner it's a very important part of of living as, as a human being for a lot of people so i guess what I've, what has been your experience with experiences with friendships and relationships and what barriers have kind of come up that, that have prevented you from moving forward in these areas I can't really speak much for relationships, but in terms of friendships, it's incredibly difficult for me to make friends. That's partly because of my autism. Mm -hmm. Well, that is actually all to do with my autism. Trying to find people with similar interests is always difficult. And yeah. it's not something that's like the stuff that I enjoy doing, the stuff that interests me, it's not easily researchable online mm -hmm. because it's sort of hidden away on Facebook or it's hidden away as an advertisement on a meetup or something like that. So, sure, sure. But I mean, I have one friend and I've known this friend now for years and I still speak to him and he's still happy to speak to me, but I can't rely on that one friend. So it would be nice to have other friends. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. People, because when you have other friends, you uh, those people back you up. Those people give you positive reinforcement, so that if you're being pressured by your parents, if your parents are having a go at you all the time, then at least you mm -hmm. have someone who's maybe on your side. Well, sure, you have a different sure. you have a different point of view as well. It's it's not just about being on your side. It's about having a different point of view and people with who look at you in different ways is always better than people that look at you just one way. And I think criticism is good. I think in moderation and I think positivity is good also in moderation. And at the moment I'm getting a lot of criticism and, and no positivity because it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to criticize me than it is to be positive towards me because Hmm. You know, if you asked, I mean, this is this is no secret, but if you ask my parents or my sister, what uh, what are the positive things about me? They'd be hard pressed to find good things to say about me. If you ask them negative things, they have loads of things that uh, I'm not good at or problems that really, they have. With that's me. not very nice at, at all. <laughs> it's 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 one of those things where they're very honest about. It. They're not trying to be mean about it it's no, their sure. honest opinion they they're not interested you know they're not interested in my interests as well so sure. that is where some of that lack of positivity comes because they don't see they don't value mm. my interests so sure i know that that particularly like as a, as i said with that kind of post kind of 18 age you know when, when we are in school we have pretty much all of our social interaction 
or opportunities for social interaction kind of laid out for us is not always the best and easiest and there's a lot of bullying and and, and difficult situations at school but it, it, it is kind of set up like that and when when particularly for me when I went off to university I quickly found out that if I wanted to make friends I needed to like find them I needed to go out and find friends and chat to people and it was something that I really struggled with at the time and it took me a long time actually to feel comfortable with kind of approaching people or talking to people or even going to events in groups and and finding friends Mm. so it's it's definitely like a very unsupported aspect of things but I know that someone in in my own life someone that I know um, had quite a, a lot of success going to there's this this place called like Andy's Man Club, I think. I think they have a few places around around the UK, um, which is bas- basic an opportunity for 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 men to kind of meet up and have a chat and and talk about like mental health aspects of things, like things to do with their life, things that they're struggling with. And the person I'm talking about is, is is autistic and and they've found that to be really, really, really great for them. But it's it's kind of like it's not set out for you. It's not like after school they can be like, hey, hey let's let's help you sort your social stuff out for the, the time after school or you know, you know, this is the path that you're gonna take down for 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 going through work. And there's not really much of that. And I think that's that's really a tough part, a part of life that I think it's it's taken me a long time to really get a grasp of and understand how to navigate. You know, well, I've tried to, uh, I've tried to do as you say, try to find groups to be involved with and try to make friends and stuff like that. But it's it's kind of difficult because it's so easy to feel left out all the time. And I, I I try to go to London Film and Comic Con, for instance. Oh, nice! And I my friend stopped going with me because he gets bored of like the repetition of going every year. Unless there's someone right. that he really wants to see, he doesn't want to do it with me, right? Sure, doesn't want to go sure. there with me, right? But that's kind of like your your kind of yearly kind of routine yeah, thing that you like to go but- to. And- but the thing is, is you think you make loads of people because everyone there is like minded. You, you think you will make loads of friends, but I don't make I don't make any friends when I'm there. There'll be a couple of people that I get into conversations with, but for the most part, if you go to something like London Film and Comic Con, it's 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 kind of everyone keep, kind of keeps to their own little groups. No one yes. wants to mingle. Yeah. There's no one. There's no one by themselves. I think I think now nine out of ten times. There's no one by themselves, and um, and so I and 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 it's a huge effort for me to go to London Film and Comic Con. I mean, it's like it's got some of the worst things for autistic people there, like Busy sensory, places, sensory, sensory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, taking pictures with celebrities and stuff like that. It's it's a real hurdle for me. It's it's definitely hard to 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 kind of form those friendships and particularly something that that's hard for me is maintaining friendships like I'm quite good at like meeting people and and talking to new people but I think just like the intricacies of you know how how people are in terms of like texting and you know having to maintain things and having to organize things I think that's something that I really struggle with and and also to be honest the, the majority of people that I'm friends with and people that I know they tend to be not in my physical f- vicinity. Like they, they tend to be people that I know online. And although that's, you know, although it's good to connect with people who are kind of like-minded and they, and they, they may be autistic themselves, it's still like I feel like it's it's quite important for me to kind of get outside and get and go and do things with friends and things of that nature. Have you had have you had much success with like making friends online? Like have you have you joined any kind of groups or um Yeah, there's one group that I well there's a YouTuber who 
he's a he's a former well he's a former director but he's he he's an editor and producer he has a youtube channel where he does a podcast about films and tv and kind of like the sort what's, of sci-fi what's the name? so his his name is robert meyer burnett and robert he meyer. owns the he owns the, the kind of the burnett work as he calls it and it's yeah, Robert Meyer Burnett, and he has a YouTube channel where he does podcasts, and he has all these different podcasts that he's set up by with different people who have worked, who are working on those podcasts mm. about various corners of kind of geek fandom and stuff like that. Sure, sure. I th- I suppose I'm I'm meaning like like chatting groups, like online, like. Zoom like peer support meetings or like group meetings that people do online or particular servers in Discord or you know any anything like that and it could it could also be through things like social media like particularly I know a lot of people who have found you know friends and and people to talk to you know they they they're kind of lonely and, and kind of isolated in their their own country and they yeah talk to other people online um, who are who are also autistic, and they they find that to be quite good, um, quite transformative for them. Well, I've I, I am part of many different uh, Discord groups and Twitter pages and social media pages or forums and stuff like that. So I've met people, and people do know me. Um, I haven't. I'm not with any specific autism groups of any kind in that sense what Mm. i have done what i have done is every tuesday or every yeah every tuesday i go to a meetup group for autistic people oh nice uh, so in wimbledon it's called the sunshine recovery cafe oh yeah and it is where people sort of talk about their week how their week has gone and uh, we kind of chat about we chat about uh, funded any... by the NHS. Yes, it is yes, and it's it's nice. it's. I think for me, in the long run, I, I feel that this is better than speaking online for, in, uh, as a faceless person. I'd rather people get to know me in person than just than just typing away hidden behind a computer. True. True, very true. I get, I get that. Like I, as I said, it's something that I feel particularly at the moment. You know, trying to find people to do stuff with and like go out and have a coffee with and stuff like that. It's it can be hard. Um, yeah, and plus, there's no one local to me as well. Anyone that I've sort of interacted with online, there isn't anyone really local to me. So it's it would be impossible to meet up with that particular person anyway so um. sure i think it would be you know useful to kind of talk about like the romance kind of relationship side of things Mm. well what have you tried in in terms of that or is that kind of on the back burner to developing a friend group i mean the more i try to invest emotions into it the more i'm disappointed and feel kind of I, i the way i see it is that i will get i i i'm I'll be as lucky to get a uh, romance as I am to get a full-time paid permanent job. Right, right. What, what have you a, used I, in the past? Because I know, I know that, you know, that there has been some apps and things that... I've tried different different dating websites, but they're all like uh, fake profiles and right. none of it's real... Not like t- Tinder, Hinge, Bumble. <laughs> Tinder, I mean Tinder's. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah, uh, there isn't really not... anything that's actually agency based in terms of agency and agency looking for to mm. to bring people together. It's more, mm. you know, you get all these fake profiles and you have to scroll down these fake profiles and oh, these people look very interesting, but. These people aren't real. They're they're not people who are in London. They're people from 
another country and they're, pas- they're posting fake profile pictures. Mm. It's, it's, mm. it's all a bit of a con, con to me, a bit of a scam sure. to me. So, um. well, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, especially if you're, if you're a man on, on dating sites, it tends to be very, very, very difficult to, to get matches or find, find people to, that, that, that are willing to match out and talk to you. And also, even further like go and go and go on actual dates and you yeah. know meet, meet you and stuff like that i know that there are some services for disabled adults but also for autistic people in in terms of like matchmaking and stuff like have you looked into anything like that i've tried but i haven't been successful in uh, finding anything anything that's been helpful long term sure. um sure. so yeah it's tough and i I think there's a lot of aspects to being autistic that can make it really hard i think in terms of dating like there's so many nuances to um both texting and in in person kind of things everything seems to be very kind of indirect uh very difficult to to understand where where you stand with somebody very and i think that is part and part due to the you know, sort of like the modern approach to dating, which is very like, you know, as soon as you see something or you don't feel completely 100% like you want to go and see someone, it's kind of like, oh, well, I'll just see what else is out there and I'll do that. And it kind of goes goes in like a leap for a lot of people. It's, I, mean, um, I mean, I use social situations like going to London Film Comic Con as practice for going on a date because it will have sure. all the same social anxiety issues, the the autism mm. issues like the loud noise, loud noises and stuff like that. Uh, when I get pictures taken with people at Comic Con, that in itself is like trying to meet someone for the first time and saying hello sure. and you're shaking their hand and putting your arm around you and stuff like that. It's very nerve wracking, and yeah. that is similar to meeting a woman for the first time because you've maybe met someone online and then you're going to see them in person and mm. it's you're trying to make conversation with them and not come across like you're totally weird you know um. yeah yeah i mean there, there, there are issues in terms of dating but I, I suppose like you know even going further than that the, the aspect of maintaining relationships particularly when it's a neurodiverse one with another uh another autistic person even and, and also particularly with with neurotypicals holistic individuals it can sometimes be a very 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 difficult thing to navigate and there's a lot of you know you, you were talking about kind of like fake profiles and stuff you know well there's there's a lot of people who do take advantage of people who um are struggling to kind of find find someone to develop a relationship with and mm. stuff and it's definitely something that i've heard about a lot I've also, I've, I mean, I've also almost been conned a couple of times before, but for the most part, they're not very clever about trying to scam me. So, mm. <laughs> so I've kind mm. of seen through it. But yeah, it's it them it, out. if if I was if I was really really desperate for interaction with a woman online, and I looked at these dating sites, I could get taken in by all of these profiles, and I could spend money to speak, to, to, to get a subscription, to be able to send messages to speak mm. to these people. Because I think most dating websites, you have to pay a subscription to be able to message. Sure. So, so you're kind of just wasting your money in the sense that you don't know if you're going to get anything out of it. I've tried a bit, I've tried a couple of times, but it's nothing good has come out of it. So the, the few times that women have talked to me on dating websites has been basically we just don't have an, anything in common. Hmm. Nothing to no no, no interests. No interests in common. And, no, no. Yeah. Hey, up! Just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far. If you could do me a real solid, please make sure to rate the podcast if you're in a podcasting streaming service, and do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. 
make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description, or head over to my Instagram page at Thomas Henley UK for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D-Buds and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. Well, um, you were saying before about kind of, you know, the kind of the, the last thing that we were going to chat about was specifically around like one of the reasons why I think you got in contact was to talk about your experiences with bullying and, and harassment yeah. online. Yeah. I know that you sent me some documents. I'm going to try and pull those up first sure. before we, we speak about them. But I think it would be, it's it's very much something that is a problem. Bullying, harassment, things like that. That's something that I think happens for a lot of autistic people, even, even just out out and about in the world or at the workplace or in school. It's very much like something that we struggle with and, and especially online. And, and also I think that there is an issue within the autistic community where there's a, there's kind of a, a minority of individuals who are very aggressively vocal about their, their opinions on certain things. And they're very harsh with anybody who kind of doesn't fit this, the ideals of language that they want you to use or the, I, but perhaps the, the, the views that you, you may have of, certain things related to autism, almost to a point where they exclude a lot of individuals who are autistic yeah. and they want to enter into the community, but perhaps aren't aware of kind of the the, the social nuances. And it, I think that's a really big issue because ideally we want people who feel isolated and they don't have you know, a job and they don't, they don't have kind of like the, the friend group and, and people around them to be able to get support and to be able to be part of a community. Mm. So, um, right. So you kind of sent me a few sort of, I guess, parts of this stuff. Yeah. They're out of Would context. You... It doesn't quite make so sense. Some of it, but some of it does. And like some of it, you obviously wouldn't need context by me, but yeah, it's. Yeah. Well, would you be able to talk a little bit about your kind of general experiences with with people online? Yeah, sure. Part of being autistic is having opinions that uh, not everyone's going to agree with. You can have opinions that are that are not the populist opinion, and that can relate to anything like film or TV or entertainment or politics or religion or whatever. And if people know you're autistic, they if they disagree with you, if you don't have the opinion that they want, they can mm. shut you down, they can make life difficult for you. Or even if they don't think you're autistic, even if they don't know you're autistic, if you don't fit within the kind of opinions that they have, they can be quite controlling and... Um, you can get banned from forums or you can be yes. bullied and harassed. Uh, you can get blocked on Twitter. I think what tends to happen on Twitter is that some people can be quite, like they can be quite kind of accepting of me because I say I have a disability on my Twitter mm. profile. They can be quite sure. uh, accepting of that. And then when they start, when they start to read what I post, they will become very defensive and say, why did you say that? You know, you shouldn't be able to, they'll, they'll kind of turn on me because it uh, really what it comes down to is that they don't know me as a person. And if I'm agreeing with them, they're absolutely fine with my disability or sure. they're, they're okay with my opinions in general. But if I, if my opinions are uh, not what they want to hear, then they can turn quite rapidly on on me, and that's why people that's why people can get blocked very easily on Twitter and stuff like that. Uh, I've been blocked from so many different forums for having a different opinion. People do not right. like different opinions on things. So, what what is it exactly that people 
don't don't like about? Well, I mean, it could be about politics, maybe the fact that uh, my views aren't progressive enough for them. So they'll say they'll call me all sorts of horrible names, or they'll say I'm not allowed near the internet, or uh, they, you know, I mean. There's a whole amount of harassment I got for supporting a games console called the Intellivision Amico. Right. And and that's where all those folders I sent you of all that stuff has come from. It's me taking evidence to show the kind of behavior and hysteria around a games console that might not be released. And what what's what's people's um particular like reject what why why do people have a particular rejection of this? Like, uh they see it's a scam, but also it's threatening their hobby. It's a gatekeeping. Right. So it's partly because they think it's a scam and they feel they're doing some kind of justice to the community, but also uh they're gatekeeping because the console is 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 doing something with its gaming that they don't like. They feel it's an intrusion on their on their uh, way of gaming, mm. you got you got to understand. A lot of the people who are complaining are hardcore gamers, and they're not into casual gaming. And what I found throughout this, I mean, a whole study could be done about this games console. But what I found is that there is a huge gap between there is a huge gap between hard what hardcore gamers are looking for in games. And what, what they accept, and what casual gamers accept as gaming, mm. Mm. and and um, and so there's been a lot of that kind of uh, sort of taking sides, and now the kind of the mm. anti side of that, the people who who don't support that console, who don't like the console, don't like the CEO, whatever, they are. Um, they they are trying to uh, get rid of the the people who do support still support the holdouts like me. Well, do you mind if I read some of the um, the the comments that people have put just to give people a bit of, I guess, un- understanding? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would recommend I would recommend a documentary that someone has done on it. Unfortunately, this documentary is very biased, <laughs> so it's in itself is is what people when people look look up the name of the console is the first thing they see, but it's not quite. It, it doesn't tell the entire truth, and um, I got into trouble with the guy who made that video because he didn't like me. He didn't want to hear some of the criticisms I had of the. Uh, this documentary is this the sweet and tender hooligan person no it's the person who did doc, doc, the documentary was called uh dj slope slope's game room slope's game mm. room so like a four four hour documentary so the, the, there is a comment that was someone who was replying to you who said at pm ferraria um ferrera those dudes are under that bus because they are still in the fetal position as the bus rolls over them. Literally, all they have to do is get out of the way, but they don't by choice. Ever noticed how someone like Cyrus Martin isn't a regular subject in my videos? Mm-hmm. That's because he finally saw Amico and Tommy for what they are, and he acted upon the revelation. Someone like me is so insignificant in this whole situation. Amico forever, forever, forever does it to themselves peeing on their own feet, if you will. Then you got someone like yourself, someone who means well and is just trying to stand up for these guys. However, the way you defend them with snarky remarks and trolling only adds to the fuel fuel the fire and makes people hate Amico forever even more. It's a good job. You do more damage than even the nastiest anti Amico troll. Yeah. So well what what is the context of, of that? So, kind of situ- so, so this guy who, this guy has actually uh, such a rabbit hole to go down to, down. But and I advise anyone listening, do not go down this rabbit hole. It is uh, it, once you go down this rabbit hole of learning about this console, it is 
a lot of toxic, to- the most toxicity I've ever seen around the games console before. There are people who have devoted their entire YouTube channels to making parodies of this console and the people who support it. They've devoted their entire YouTube account to this console. Right. So it's a very, very, very controversial kind of issue. I mean, I understand that that it's kind of the situation is probably more nuanced than than would be able to be explained just just from what you said. But I think there is something that I think would be worth talking about is kind of like what kind of impacts do do these kind of interactions that you you have on these these forums or these videos and, and channels and stuff have on you as a person like have on on your kind of mental health and your your kind of self-esteem and confidence well for me it's 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 given me kind of it's fed into that depression uh, that i have and feeling upset feeling alone there are a couple of people who try to see things try to give a more neutral approach to this but they're shut down by the people who dislike the console and so they're in a minority as well and so you know i have an online stalker i have an online stalker who uh, reposts randomly reposts anything i've ever said on social media on uh, discord so that's not, that's not okay. I mean, I mean, this is they they on this Discord channel they repost basically any time anyone's mentioned the the name of the console, they've reposted the comment by the they've reposted the tweet or comment by this person. So anytime it's ever been mentioned, that's how obsessed they are, either to shame those people or to. Or, or you know, to uh, to point out here's some here's something to look at today, guys. You know, and that's how obsessive it is. It's going into people's personal lives as well, finding out you know uh, what car they're driving. It, it's uh, people have got doxxed over this, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, people have apparently, yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. So it's it's been incredible, but for me it's what I feel what I find uh, when it when it comes back to the whole appreciation thing is like if I'm not getting appreciation in the real world I kind of would like it online, but there aren't people backing me up and people that I thought were friends to me, people who I thought would back me up are are kind of taking the other side because they're YouTubers and they don't want to ruin their view count. Hmm. They, they're making content like this uh, Slopes Game Room guy. He doesn't want to... A lot, of his, a lot of his views are coming from the people who hate the console. And that's why he made the documentary. Hmm. And he doesn't want to lose that. So he's he, he's kind of sort of encouraging well not encouraging but he's going on this discord server and he's he's courting he's courting those those toxic uh, gamers mm-hmm. because because he knows that they will be looking at de- at his content in the future whereas me if i go and i complain to him about the harassment he will say that it's all because of me or it's all on me or that he he he'll he'll look at those comments that I've given you, those screenshots, mm. and he'll say that's because I rub people the wrong way, right? Which isn't fair to me because some of that stuff, even out of context, you I wouldn't say that to someone. Yes, some of that stuff to people. I mean that 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 YouTube comment that you read out, that was mm-hmm. threatening someone, saying that someone had got off YouTube, that, that had been driven off YouTube because of his parody videos on him. Right. This guy had done parody videos, this sweet and tender hooligan or whatever, and on parody videos, and now he's this serious Martin guy isn't on YouTube anymore because of it. Right. So, so the people, like kind of, there's a lot of kind of intimidation. 
It's intimidation. Harassment. Harassment, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah doxing yeah. and And this guy it does, sounds and very, so, very, very I just want to say though, this guy since then has actually apologized, but we'll see if he goes back to his old ways again. And there are other people who have there's one guy who remains who 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 screenshots everything to do with this console and he's defaced my profile picture on Twitter. He's made me look like a clown. And he reposts that every time on that Discord. If I ever said anything on that Discord, he would just post a picture of my clown, like clown picture, uh, to make me look stupid, to say that they don't want to, you know, they don't want to hear from me, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, I don't have a voice on there. So, so I continue to fight back, but it's a one man battle and there's no one in my corner who, who wants to hear from me because even if I send the abuse over, they kind of have their own lives and they'll forget about it after a week. They'll forget about, you know, but even, even send, like send the abuse over, what do you mean? Like if I send the screenshots that I've, I've sent you over as proof, they, they'll forget about it after a week. The, the my online stalker, for instance, is interesting because even though he's been reposting all my stuff, a few YouTubers have actually got in contact with me, or at least one YouTuber has got in contact with me to say he's noticed now how obsessive this person is. It it sounds um like just to kind of like it's it's obviously not an okay thing for people to kind of stalk and and troll and you know just generally be nasty people online yeah have you i mean have you considered just not being involved in in the discussion on that like is that something that you feel you you could do because it, it sounds like you know but, but you know particularly for me you know I, i've had situations you know within my own work where People have not agreed and they've sent me lots of horrible things like I'm a Nazi and like it's because of because I used to use the word Asperger's as part of my profile picture when it was okay. Um right. <laughs> and it only kind of changed and then I changed it. So it's um so I, I've experienced that stuff before. And I understand that there is a sense of like morality around situations like that where you when you feel like you know, you, you're right about things and you feel like people are wronging you, that you you kind of want to stand up and kind of speak about things. But if it if it's getting to a point where, you know, you have people who are, I guess, atta- uh, well, attacking you or harassing you or, or things like that, have you, have you not just considered, like, deactivating something or starting up a new account and just not being involved in the whole thing? Well, I could, but, you know, I'm... I'm... By nature, I'm quite a stubborn person, mm-hmm. and me too. I get I, that. I, I I don't feel that those people should win. I think I I would only do that. I would only do that if I could expose them for sure. for what they've done. Because I think this is what what I've gathered together in terms of evidence is 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 kind of I've encapsulated encapsulated uh, uh, just you don't even need to know about the console but it's an encapsulation of how toxic social media can be Hmm. and i Hmm. think it makes a very i think this makes a really really good case study if someone wanted to do it because it is normally when people say stuff online you don't get the full you don't you don't really get full context you don't get full you only get maybe like one tweet or something that you, sure. or online that you see that's that's a bad tweet or something like that. With this, you have a, a sort of encapsulation of the whole entire thing, and it, it, it's good to it's good to study. I think it's good to, to kind of study it from a detached point of view, but mm. also it brings to light the harassment that. Uh, social media can provide as well sure yeah yeah i mean i i understand that it's, it's probably a, a lot more of a, a nuanced situation 
I guess I want to move away a bit from like the 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 topic of of them um and particularly the 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 actual kind of situations and I guess talk a bit more generally about your kind of experiences you know the things that we talked about the things about independence the things about sort of relationships friendships yeah um and employment you know do you, do you, do you have any kind of like I know you you've mentioned about kind of the OCD and and the anxiety and stuff, but how has this kind of impacted your your overall well being? All of these different factors, and what do you think needs to change for 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 people like you to, so that you can thrive and develop in the world? Well, I mean, I think the the major thing is that reaching forty, it's it's given me this kind of feeling in life that I want to make more of my life. And yes. I'm not getting that at the moment. I think the biggest frustration for me is that I, I, I am not being noticed. I'm not being seen. And I, I, it's not so much an ego thing. It's more that I'm not being given the same opportunities that I see other people get. Sure. And I'm perfectly capable of doing the types of work or doing the types of things that other people do, but I'm not being given the chance. I'm fall, I've am i kind of fallen through the cracks and I'm not being allowed to develop and it's uh, not being heard, not being seen, not being heard and not being able to contribute something positively as a legacy at my age is, is really damning. And... I think that's the biggest takeaway that I that I that sums up all of all of my kind of issues. Right. So I think that if I'd got more support to begin with at school or I could definitely have done better in, in terms of qualifications maybe. Hmm. I haven't done too badly all things considered so that's quite an achievement but in terms of developing into someone who could work in an industry, I haven't been given that chance. I haven't been given that advocacy. Mm. And so I've kind of been left by the wayside. And so I'm just an old man yelling at the clouds going, come on, why don't you listen to me? Why don't you? And this is this encapsulates the harassment I get, the the, the 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 lack of jobs, lack of relationships, lack of friends, all of that, and my own my own insecurities about my health as well. Mm. All of that is because there's not enough awareness around me, and not enough people noticing who I am and and stuff like that. So I would hope that I can. I would hope at my age I could try to get through to more people, try to get more people to listen. And, and people seem to think I'm an intelligent person. Uh, I don't know how intelligent uh, some people would say. Some people who've worked for me said I'm incompetent. So I don't know. But people, when well, they talk I've to me... I've had that as well. I, I get very conflicting messages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I, I think I spoke... I don't know if I spoke to, to you uh, about this before, but half of the half of the people who come up to me when they look at my face they 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 think I look like a friendly person I'm they're happy to speak to me they're happy to carry on a conversation with me get to know me they're interested in getting to know me half half of the other people who come up to me they look at my face they think I'm brain dead because yeah. facially I'm not a person who expresses themselves very mm. easily so which is untrue. I'm not brain dead. I'm just yeah. not. I'm just not. So those kind of social assumptions that people have. Yeah. So they think I'm incompetent, or they don't think I can look after myself. They think there's they think there's something wrong with me, and I don't think it should be that way. But that that that's kind of the that's kind of the the thing about once once people get to know you more, that's when. That's that's when they start to understand you a bit more, and you can't do that in just in person. You can't do that just online. You have to have a mixture of both. 
but sure. I'm afraid I'm afraid to I'm afraid to get anyone to follow me on Twitter because they might be offended by by some of my hot takes or you know um, some of the stuff I say but I mean well that's all I can say I mean well I don't mean to offend people I don't try to make people's life horrible I don't go on social media to troll in hmm. intentionally I, I go onto social media to have fun but I don't troll to hurt other people's feelings I, I troll but I don't troll to hurt other people's feelings I don't I, I I'll make jokes I'll hmm. make jokes I'll be funny about something but I won't try to intentionally be rude and if I am and if it's pointed out that I am and how I've hurt someone I'm more than happy to apologize because sure. I'd I'd hate to think that I could upset someone else that I didn't mean to. Mm. Mm. Especially someone's feelings. Social rejection for me is the worst thing. Yeah. So it it is something that I feel a lot of people can empathize with, that kind of Jobs, feeling, feeling of social rejection and yeah. Social media. The the like the overarching feeling that I'm I'm getting is that, you know, it's it's very much a case that you know, something that I talk about a lot, which is that people really don't understand autistic people. And we we really don't have the level of support that's needed for us to live happy and fulfilling lives if we if we're not given the opportunities to thrive. It's never it's never really gonna happen. And I know a lot of people who have, you know, gone on gone on to benefits and you go on to PIP and stuff because they, they can't deal with the 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 intricacies and the discrimination in in the workplace they 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 often withdraw from finding friends and relationships because of those negative experiences that we we tend to to have a lot of time which is also related to understanding autism and i think there's a lot of different areas in life which i think you know can really affect us and it's you know, it's 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 disappointing that the systems aren't apt enough or not good enough to support individuals who who may need it. Which is, well, as I've not... said, it's pretty much non-existent past the age of twenty-five. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not entitled to benefits, so I'm not. I'm not just. I'm not a lazy individual who just stays at home and uh, sucks off the uh, leeches off the government or whatever. I actually I, generally. I think, I think... I, I genuinely I, I, would like to work. I genuinely would like to work, mm. but I'm not being given the opportunity to for a career. Yeah, I, I would say that that the, there is a majority of people who who don't do that. I think there's the, a minority of people who may have that kind of approach to things, but in right. terms of like the benefits and stuff. But um, I'd hesitate to to I guess generalize it to a, to a lot of people. I guess um, okay. Just when it's fake. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. I <laughs> you guess. know, just I, no. You're I, correct. I, yeah, I get what I get what you're saying. It's but it, you know. I mean, I think I think it's it's been really useful talking to you, Pedro, and and hearing about your experiences. You know, in in life from from different aspects, and I think, you know, you, your story kind of highlights a lot of, you know, the things that I I talk about a lot, which is those those areas at which we we're really kind of not supported in them we're kind of falling behind in things so i i really appreciate you you coming on to to, to speak me to speak to me about this it's okay i'm happy uh to be here and uh just like to say thank you for this opportunity of course of course well if you have enjoyed this episode of the 40 Audi podcast make sure to give it a like if you're on youtube or if you're on spotify or any of the other podcasting streaming services make sure to give it a rating always really really helps push these messages push these podcasts out to people who may really really need them if you want to check out more of the stuff that i do i do a lot of stuff over on instagram um do daily blogs daily videos and my youtube channel if you're not if you're not listening to this on there it has a lot of different separate clips from all of the podcasts that I do. So if you feel like the episodes are a bit too long and you want it kind of chunked up and, and to listen to specific areas and, and topics that we, we cover in the podcast, uh, you can find those over on YouTube. And yeah, if, if you want to get in touch, 
very much do so through my email, hi at Thomas Henley UK, for anything related to public speaking, um, to consulting, to uh, my personal uh, coaching. Uh, please, please head over onto that and uh, send me an email. Um, I'll give you some details about that. Or ideally, you know, go go to the link tree that's always in the, the description. You, you'll be able to find everything, including the sponsor of the podcast, Steebuds, which really, really great, great things if you want to go check them out. They're like kind of these adjustable noise cancelling earbuds that you can use, kind of like loop, just to be a little bit more interesting in terms of like adjusting the volume that you can listen to things on so definitely check those out if you are in the market for some nice earbuds and yeah so i guess one of the last things that i want to ask you pedro is um have you enjoyed your 40 audi experience yeah um as i was saying before um i really uh enjoyed all of this i, lo- I just loved the opportunity to come on come on here and um talk about my life and experiences with autism um it's just really to get myself out there and uh so you have maybe another experience from someone uh of autism mm-hmm. uh and um hopefully it, i've contributed to something uh useful uh but thank you for uh giving me this opportunity oh you're very welcome it's been been really lovely to, to chat to you and uh, as i said i think you've highlighted a lot of things that a lot of people would be able to relate to and a lot of issues that, that are currently facing a lot that work a large majority of autistic people so thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of the 40 Audi podcast hope you've got something good from this let me know your thoughts in the comments or send me a message or contact me on instagram say if there's anything that you really resonated on this and i will see you next week in another episode of the 40 Audi podcast see you later guys